The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus, not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth day of the Minority Health Film Festival presented by Freydert and the Medical College of Wisconsin. I am Keisha Shanks, and I will be your moderator this evening for this discussion. Um, we will be discussing the films The American Dream and um, Through the Night. So before we get started, let's go ahead and get the rest of the panel brought on and let everyone introduce themselves and the wonderful work that they are doing. So, Linda, would you like to go first? <laughs> sure. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Linda Araceli. I am a Chicana birth worker. I am a school age educator, a mother of two long haired, self identifying boys. Um, if you see smoke, I'm not smoking, I'm smudging, um, just grounding myself. Um, and I'm really happy and to be here. I, I feel honored to be among um, the beautiful five people who are here. I included myself in the five people. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll, yes, thank you. Thank you for being here. I feel um, a lot of gratitude for being here. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone who's here as well. Yeah. Hi, I'm Leanne Jordan. I am a mom, a Kenyan immigrant a doula, uh, and I am the executive director of Maroon Calabash. We're an equal access doula uh, coordinating agency founded in reproductive justice. Nicole. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nicole Miles. I am a birth worker and my day job, I am the doula program manager for the Birth Outcomes Made Better doula program at the Milwaukee Health Department. I've been a birth worker since 2012. I'm originally from Chicago and I really am appreciative that you all invited me to on this part of this panel. I know most of the lovely people on this panel and I'm so appreciative that all chose me to be one of those panelists. So thanks. Yante. Hi, uh, my name is Yante Turner. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I'm a birth worker. I'm also a trans person. Um, and I'm a, a person of many hats. <laughs> I think I wear a lot of roles. Um, but like my official title or like day job title is inclusion and equity coordinator for that diverse and resilient. But I also work under and serve with Maroon Calabash with Leanne. Um, and I'm like placed at Pathfinder and doing a lot of work with the young people who experience um, housing, displacement, uh, mental health, and various other things, along with also carrying a baby. Um, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Well, I am Keisha Shanks. I um, I am the owner of the Mindful Mama. Um, <laughs> the work that I do is always I'm a birth worker, but I'm also a maternal and infant mental health consultant. So um, a lot of the work that I do with my agency with moms and babies is rooted in um, creating strong relationships, decolonizing parenting and um, really improving social and emotional efficacy with women, um, Black birthing women, Black mothers, um, and their children. So that's, I guess that's the Cliff Notes version <laughs> 
of the work that I do. And like everyone else has mentioned, I'm really honored to be here and especially to be moderating this conversation. These are topics that are near and dear to me because I am also a mom. I probably should have led with that is that I'm a mom. I have a beautiful and amazing, strong, smart 13 year old girl. So um, I've been, I've experienced a lot of the things that, you know, our moms are going through that we see, you know, in our programs day to day. And also that were represented in the films that we'll be um, loosely talking about or just some of the issues that they covered. Um, so I guess one of the main themes that, um, that I saw in the film, in both of the films, was um, the fact it was, uh, it was a lot of intergenerational trauma that was at play, um, especially in um, the first film. Um, where the moms were were giving birth and their birth stories were they experienced a lot of trauma at the hands of their medical providers. Um, and I guess I would like for you all to kind of talk about what some of your experiences have been um, with that and working with with families and with moms in the delivery room and leading up to delivery. So. Leanne, <laughs> you want to say something? I was going to go first, but somebody's trying to get buzzed in, so I didn't want the, <laughs> the phone to go off in the bathroom, but it's all right. Um, yes, so uh, prior to uh, co-founding Maroon Calabash, I've also had a doula practice for the last 10 years, and Oh, um, we see as birth workers, um, and if anybody doesn't know, a doula is a, a labor support person uh, that supports folks. There's all kinds of doulas, but primarily when people talk about doulas, they're talking about birth doulas. And so um, they support folks who are pregnant, birthing, and in their postpartum period to do so with education and information um, to uh do so understanding what the benefits, risks, and alternatives to anything that may be presented to them by their medical provider, and um, to, if necessary, support the birthing people and their loved ones in advocacy if needed um, with institutions, um, care providers, or uh, uh, agencies that may be coming into contact with them and causing harm. And specifically for black and brown people, what we do is um, act as a buffer for a system that has been uh, embedded or white supremacy has been embedded within uh, the system of modern medicine. Um, and so when I have supported folks and when our doulas support folks, we see trauma show up in delivery. Uh, even before somebody delivers, we can tell um, that something may show up in labor because they're already starting to have anxiety around it. Their body may be already trying to protect them in certain ways, elevated blood pressure or um, certain pains or uh, restlessness and inability to fall asleep. And so we always encourage, and I always encourage the parents I work with to find a safe place to sit with those feelings, to confront those feelings, to um, seek out support so that they can have access to tools to um, understand the origin of those things because it is so much better to deal with those things before you deliver than to be in contractions and our bodies don't feel safe, our bodies don't feel heard, our bodies don't feel um, comfortable opening and that can lead to longer labors, longer um, contractions, more um, challenges with our body uh, doing what it needs to do to open and deliver our children. Uh, but that is one of the biggest ways I see intergenerational trauma showing up is in people's mindsets and their emotions um, and even in their body's physiology of how it internalizes trauma and holds on to it. Um, and so I think being pregnant and, and delivering your baby is a really wonderful invitation to be able to confront what your DNA is holding on to and be able to uh, invite yourself to release some of that and to heal it as well. Yeah. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to add or? 
Um, I did for a little, uh, specifically on like intergenerational trauma um, and also how it's weaved into DNA, like Leanne said. Um, and I think especially for like the younger people who are having babies, like they know what their parents are telling them. Um, and like people, my mama said, this is gonna hurt, so it's gonna hurt. And they mm-hmm. stick with that, regardless of like how much Abby, like, no, if you if you do this position in this position in this position, it takes so much time to, it, to, to honestly destroy that narrative and also like recreate one where they feel safe and they feel protected and affirmed and listened to. But they like like Leanne said, they hold on to it. It becomes something they get codependent upon. Is that fear because that has been the only thing that has been given, or that keeps being instilled into them when they do go to medical providers who do harm? Yeah. yeah, in terms, I agree. And in terms of um, you know going to medical providers that that do harm, um, let's just you know be honest because we're having honest conversation here tonight which is the fact that um, majority of medical providers that are not black and that are serving wow. black people or people of color, um, and especially when those people are um, poor, um, uneducated, or um, whatever the case may be, LGBTQ, whatever, um, they tend to do more harm systemically and the things that they expect or the things that they um, that they do. So, for example, I'll use um, a situation that I had with a mom. Um, the clinic where she went to for her prenatal care was here in the city of Milwaukee. It's in the central city. Um, just the general, the overall condition of the clinic was subpar. So, I mean, that's another issue. The fact that, you know, there's not... You don't have state-of-the-art equipment in the inner city. You don't have, um, you know, qualified professionals that are socially and emotionally qualified. They're they're not very sympathetic, and they bring their biases into the into the room. Okay, so I had a mom. She's seven months pregnant, um, on the verge of preeclampsia, blood pressure is a little bit high. She doesn't drink water. Only thing she wants to drink is Coca-Cola. She's drinking the Coca-Cola because she says she's nauseous and the Coca-Cola helps to settle her stomach. Her Mm -hmm. doctor, the attending physician, now I had already spoken to her and I said, well, honey, there are some other things that you can do. Have a, let's try, let's try gender. Let's try some tea. Um, Let's try, you know, what time of day are you getting nauseous? Are you getting nauseous? Have you eaten anything? Have you, you know, Is it before or after you eat or what are you eating? You know, going through those things with her and saying, well, you know, Coca-Cola really isn't the best thing. The sugar, the caffeine, there's no nutritional content that's really not doing anything for you or your baby. And it's not hydrate. It's not hydrating either of you. It's it's sugar, water, basically. So I'm telling her all this. And she's like, yeah, I know. So we talk about it in the doctor's office and the doctor says, well, that's that's fine. I don't see that being a problem. You can drink Coca-Cola every day. And I'm looking at the doctor. Why would you tell her that? And afterwards, he said, well, she's going to do it anyway. How do you know that she's going to do that? So just the overall approach and how, you know, even in terms of encouraging healthy habits, even those things um, are often presented to us through the lens of, of whiteness and what's expected or not expected of us. And that's not okay because that creates, you know, further issues down the line with birth, uh, with health outcomes. And, you know, when we talk about health inequities and things like that, those things stem from from systems because of the way that we are treated. Um, Healthcare is not necessarily prioritized in the African-American community and in the Latin community and the Native communities. We're kind of roughing it with less than what other communities have. So, oh, go ahead. I'll go. Um, I just want to say one part of being a black birth worker is a is a not a challenge. But it's a constant. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what's ha- this is what's wrong. These are the bad things. These are the poor outcomes. 
we don't ever address the other side of it. There are people who are black women who are healthy. There are black women who do stand up for themselves. There are black women who have families that have experienced trauma and have reframed that into being something that's sustainable, into being something that is you are able to advocate for yourself. So I always give the example of my mom who her mother gave birth. Did we talk about the way that she gave birth? But one thing that my mom's friend told her was that this is going to be painful, but you will get through it. So she had unmedicated births because that one person fed into her. One person said that and that's all that my mom needed to be encouraged. So she wasn't a doula, but that encouragement, that positive reinforcement is prevalent in our community. You do have people who talk about their positive experiences. We keep talking about these bad things, and this is what happened to me. These, these are the traumatic events when we really need to highlight those positive and those affirming things that also happen, because that is part of the reason why this fear is able to be maintained. The control is always that control still exists, and also. One thing that my mom also instilled in us is from a very young age, being able to speak for yourself with a medical medical provider so that you, when you go into the doctor's office, this is your visit. This is your body. And there are a lot of moms who do that. They don't do it in the, you know, the textbook way or ask these questions or like have an advocacy or autonomy for yourself. It's just, no, you speak up and you ask this person what you need. And a lot of our moms did that. So we just we also need to talk about that, how even though our moms did that, the system systemically is not built up and it's not set up for us. So that me being 30 years old and going to my normal gynae provider and she wasn't there, the substitute um, gynae provider wasn't the same. So I'm used to this standard of care. And when I didn't get it, because I know my rights, because I, I'm a birth worker, I just refused care. For some women, they think this is the only option. If you think this is your only option, if you don't change your healthcare system, you just said you may have the you may have badger care, you may be on Medicaid, but you know that you don't have to go to this one clinic. You have access to these other Absolutely. options. And I think that's one thing that systemically we can do because you are a consumer at the end of the day. You can pick and choose where you go. And at any point, you can change your provider. So I just want to remind people that there are bad and negative things that do happen. Let's affirm the good things that happen. Let's talk about how little things that you do within your family, within your circle, and help to mitigate some of the systemic things that are happening to us and to our bodies. Absolutely. That's that's a great point. Um, just the fact that, you know, we don't we experience hardships, but we don't have to wear them as a part of our identities. Um, and there are a lot of positive birth experiences and there are a lot of, you know, black babies that are thriving. I know Milwaukee, we have the highest infant mortality rates in the country. Um, and that's largely due to racism and systemic racism and things like that. But there are a lot of babies that live and that thrive and that do very well. Um, so it's important to share those stories, but also to normalize that. Um, I think a lot of those things have been denormalized. And so for us to talk about advocacy and speaking up for yourself and demanding certain things and changing your providers, those are things that we need to rep that we need to normalize. And I know it's kind of looked at as a revolutionary thing now, but it's it's a normal thing. It's something that we've always done. We've always had culturally, we've always had doulas and midwives and things. This is, you know, we're going back to the beginning. We're going back to how we all started from. Um, and that's like the important thing. I think colonialism and <laughs> and racism have taken us so far off the path of the things that are naturally occurring to us. And trauma and hardship is not something that is naturally occurring to us. But um, through that, over the last few hundred years, we've been conditioned to wear that as a badge of honor and to wear that survival as a badge of honor. And it's not we should be normalizing the healthy birth experiences. We should be normalizing doulas. Um, we need healthcare providers to be receptive and welcoming and um, collaborative 
with doulas and midwives and other birth support people that are with this mom and this and this family and with this father, you know, helping them bring life earthside. Mm -hmm. So what were, I guess, um, you know, the film Into the Night, that one was, that was, that film struck me um, because it really speaks to the, the role that um, birth workers and caregivers play when it, re when it comes down to child rearing and, and birthing. Um, we're never just birth workers. We're never just doulas. We wear all of these other hats in order to support this family the best way that we can. And in that, sometimes we need support. How are you guys with um, navigating that in your work? Everybody don't can go. I, can, I, can, I, can I speak again? Can I speak again? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to give the caveat that I am very blessed that birth work is my day job, my night job, my nine to five, my all of that. That is my life. What is really important is being able to disconnect from that and finding an outlet, whether it's therapy, whether it's going outside because that's so important. But as when birth work is truly your purpose and it's your calling and it's, it's not a job. It is an all-encompassing thing. It is your life's work so that all of these things that we're hearing about breastfeeding rates and about all of these all the things happening in the hospitals, we've known that to be true. It's, it's like a visceral feeling. when You go into a hospital and you are supporting somebody who the system is not set up for them. So that is like, it just it takes over your body in a month and like, in this very specific type of way, and me just going to the office at the health department and being able to, you know, put my doula program together, that's something very different. When I have to go and serve a family or help a mom breastfeed, who help a mom who reached out to the hospital lactation provider and they told her, oh, your baby not eating in 12 hours and the baby is three days old, that's okay. Really having to unpack those things about I'm supposed to trust this system. I'm supposed to use this experience. My insurance, I have insurance. I, I birthed at, at this world now hospital and you're basically giving me misinformation. But me, I have to come swoop in and save this savior for you and your baby. I carry that with me. So uh, what my therapist says is, is a sense of um, survivor's remorse. So I can, I, I'm able to watch these things happen. I'm able to you know, be a spectator or a bystander in it. So, like that's a privilege that I have, but these what this is happening to this person, this is happening to this family, and I'm thankful that I'm able to serve them. But the survivor's remorse and that that trauma, because birth workers do experience some vicarious trauma, is a very real thing. And watching mm -hmm. the movie, it's hard, like watching the movie Into the Night, really was an eye opener for me. It told me that you need to there's times where you need to stop. You need to rest because you can't be everything for everybody. Yes. But talking to people like Leanne and my other birth worker friends, we have to come together and talk about our experiences, how it feels in our body in order to unpack that in order to be able to address it in a way so that we are, we're, we're mad. We're pissed. We're pissed. That is the feeling. That is the thought. That is the attitude. That our, that's our attitude around it. How do we use that? So instead of us continuing to be this, these angry, pissed off, you know, having all these feelings, we have to use that to fuel us. So I have to have my birth worker friend say, okay, you need to, Nicole, you're doing too much, or you need to take a break, or hiring an assistant, hiring a social, somebody to handle my social media. Those are very real, tangible ways that me personally have to take a break and take a step back from this work. Yes. What about you, Linda? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, birth work is is a way of life. You know, it's it's um, it's it's not just prenatal, labor delivery, postpartum, and you know, it's it's um, it it's 
it's a decolonization process, you know, it's, it's, um, it's returning back to who we were, which is what you were talking about, Keisha, right? I, I really um, am I'm starting to see life more as, um, as a spiral, right? Like we go through these cycles and, um, and, and, and all of us here, we're doing the work to, to go back to what, what our ancestors used to do, how we would support one another, um, right? It was always in community. Um, and like that, that to me is the answer of when I'm not well is because I'm isolating myself. Um, I'm, I'm not tapping into my support system. And um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really, really um, being ap unapologetic about is, is um, and not feeling guilt for is resting, you know? I think that that was one of the things that I saw a lot in, um, in, in the film Into the Night was how these mothers just felt so guilty for not having the time to spend with their children, um, for not being able to provide, right? There was a mom that had the three jobs and there, there was just guilt. Um, and, and I've experienced that as a mother, um, you know, like I've been a mom for almost seven years and, um, and honestly, like that be becoming a parent, aside from like also giving birth, I think, um, Leanne, you said this, that, that it's, um, it's an opportunity to confront intergenerational trauma, right? And and um, and we can heal or we can tense up, right? Which like in birth, when you tense up, when you stop breathing, it becomes more painful. You suffer, yeah. right? Same thing in life, right? When we tense up, when we stop breathing, life feels really, really hard. Um, and and when I when I gave birth for the first and the second time, and um, my second was born right here at home. It was, it was a magical, magical birth. And, um, and that pregnancy, I, I resisted that pregnancy. I did not want to be pregnant. I did not want to have another child at that time. And, um, and anyway, I share this because, because going from the point of, um, of learning that I'm pregnant, not wanting to be pregnant, to doing all of this healing work during my pregnancy, to be able to give birth here at home um, in a self-directed, you know, I had my midwife, but but it was a very self-directed birth. Um, you know, I was I was just listening to my body, right? I was so in tune with my body and um that I was able to do that. And then um you know, when, when you give birth, you become a parent. It's like you get thrown into a blender, right? And then you got to come out and you got to like find, find, um, find your footing, right? Get grounded. And, and that, that for me took a really long time. It took a really long time. Um, and I remember feeling guilty for so many things because I didn't, because I wasn't meeting my own expectations of what I thought I was supposed to be as a parent. I wasn't meeting other people's expectations. Um, and I knew it because um, part of part of my parenting is also um, is also you know um, not doing everything that my parents did, right? And so, in a way, it's it's like parenting without without a blueprint for a lot of things. And so then I'm getting pushed back from my family because I don't hit my kids, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't correct them the way that they want me to correct them because I don't nip the tantrum in the bud when they've gotten frustrated because, you know, they just can't handle what's going on. Um, so anyway, like I just, I constantly felt guilt. I constantly felt inadequate in a lot of ways. Um, and so um, I saw that a lot in the film. And um, 
I think that it's really hard to talk about it. It's really hard to talk about like when we're feeling this way. Um, but anyway, like going back to like what what I what I do in order to um, to take care of myself is is I have to tap into community. I have to, um, and and a part of my community is um, is my therapist. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> part of my community is my um, my healer. You know, I have a spiritual healer that I go to. Um, I have my and and who who has taught me um, spiritual practices um, to ground myself, right? So that I so that I can do that for myself, so that I don't always have to go to someone. Um, but honestly, it's just like spiraling back. Like what what did our great 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 grandparents do, right? Like we just had each other. We had each other, and um, and we don't necessarily exist. We don't exist in the same society that they did, right? None of us do. Um, but like, how do we recreate that in in a way that's like relevant to um, how we exist currently? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, was someone about to speak? I don't want to speak over anybody. <laughs> you can go ahead, Keisha. No, go ahead, Yante. You were gonna speak. <laughs> um, I am notoriously bad at self care. This question comes up in every single panel, and even at that point, I never, I have, ne I haven't learned the lesson. Every time it come up, I'm like, yeah, I'm still. Uh, <laughs> and 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 I think a lot of it is like at the at the root of birth work is serving and caregiving. At the root of birth work is autonomy and. <laughs> and honoring dignity, right? Like it's it's valuing the human that's in front of you. And that work feels so sacred and holy to a point of codependence. Um, at least for me, like I, I jumped into birth work and I was like, okay, this is my game plan. I need to learn all of this in this amount of time and be out there birthing babies and helping people birth babies. Um, and these expectations that mimicked white supremacy that mimicked patriarchy, that mimicked and, and perpetuated these things that like birth work isn't, right? Or these, these ways that we're supposed to exist in birth work. I was doing the exact opposite to keep up with an expectation that I had set and myself and failed myself with. Um, and, and, and even now, like as a Maroon Calabash doula, we, we, we get these opportunities to have self-care, to like it literally is like here, <laughs> right? And for real, though. No. Like for real. I and I still hesitate because I'm like, am I deserving of a territory? Can I can I go buy crystals? Does that feel real? Right? And I'm like, I don't even think I did enough birth work this month. And and then I have to remind myself, it's not about that. Um, it's not about that. And the people that I'm serving know know why we're doing this work. Um, and also you, you, you wear the work on your body birth, you know, birth workers when they're in the room together, you'd be like, mm -hmm, and they birth some babies, right. Or they support some, right. Like, you know, cause it's a different type of care. It's a different type of way people move in the world when they, when like it's in your core, it's in your DNA or it's intertwined with everything, you know, they care and love differently. They hold space differently. Um, and you get swept up into that, forgetting that your body is a body. Um, and that it gets tired and that you need to eat and that you need to like put your phone down or you can need to be transparent with your client and be like, but I can't take this claw. It's 10. It's 10. Yes. And I will be here in the morning. Right. But that's like we have it's hard. It's always a transition that you never really get used to, at least for me. And I think you used to. I haven't been doing this work very long. Birth work hasn't been something that I've known very long, but caring and serving has. Um, I'm tired. Like, I'm yeah. tired. <laughs> tired. So yeah. Yes. To add to that, um, if anybody's wondering what Yante is talking about in Maroon Calabash, we have a healing justice fund, and so that means healing justice is a term that um, we use to define 
our act of resiliency. So we use these funds. <laughs> we have worked hard for these funds. We have bled and lost sleep over these funds to be able to make sure that people don't burn out. Um, healing justice adds to the resiliency of our movements and birth work, reproductive justice, Black Lives Matter. These are all movements that we are involved in um, that are intersectional and cover so many people's identities and so much work. Um, and like we've been talking about since the beginning of, of this discussion, we experience secondhand trauma. And so as a birth worker, when I first started, um, the fund really became a selfish pursuit of mine because I was not making a lot of money serving low income women like myself. Um, I did not have the funds to be able to go get a massage, to go talk to my therapist about what I saw and witnessed, what brought tears to my eyes, what both joy and sorrow. I wasn't able to um, access what I needed to be well, and then be in conversations like this with other birth workers and all of us are sitting there like this, like, oh my God, I need a break because somebody experienced trauma and I was in the room or I had to advocate so hard for my client to get what she was trying to receive from her medical providers. And so we have built a curated list of practitioners in our community that are Black, that are Indigenous, that do root work, that um, provide services and products that nourish our soul, that nourish who we are, our core, and that allow us to explore. So maybe you're not really into Reiki, or maybe you've never tried um, purchasing crystals, or uh, maybe you've never gotten a massage before, and to be able to feel what it feels like to explore pleasure in your body through different mediums means that when I show up to your birth, I'm showing up as my full self. I'm showing up well. I'm showing up because I have put down the traumas or weights that have been as a black woman handed to me by society that I go around holding all of this weight, I can put that down because I have rested. I have been nourished. My soul is fed. Um, and I think that's a huge component that when we talk about modern birth work gets left out because um, in our cultures, when you look at how birth work operated and where it fit in the village, where it fit in the community, these people who did this work, who st stood at the gap of life and death, right? Um, guardians of this space, we held each other. 90% of our time was taking care of ourselves. <laughs> it was taking me, taking care of you. As another birth worker, may I make you some tea? Can we can we start preparing some herbs for two weeks from now? Can we can we discuss what you've been experiencing as we do those things? We were in community with each other in such beautiful ways, and I think that's really what the answer part of the answer of Maroon Calabash is. We exist to provide community for ourselves first, because as birth workers we need that, and then to provide a beautiful community for our community to birth into um, and to be able to access uh, reproductive wellness, however they define that for themselves. So yes, reproductive, or I'm um, sorry, uh, healing justice is a really crucial part of birth work, especially for black and brown people, because without it, I'm convinced you'll burn out. I'm convinced you will resent the work. I'm convinced you will push your body, your family, your friends beyond the point of, um, of safety beyond the point of, um, beyond a breaking point. And, and that's not the kind of birth worker you want to show up in your space. Keisha, you're muted. You're muted, muted Keisha. <laughs> Sorry, those things are, are very important. I know for myself, I've been in birth work for almost 11 years. And when I first started birth work, I mean, I've always been a woman of service. I've always loved women and children and babies have always naturally gravitated to me. Um, but when I started this work officially a little almost 11 years ago, um, I went in with, you know, I, I had a savior complex myself. I'm like, okay, I have these women. They 
you know, may not have had the same upbringing that I did and things like that, and they need help. And I got into the work um, through prenatal care coordination program and quickly realized that these women needed a lot more support than just the things, you know, they didn't need diapers, free diapers or free baby beds. Like these were not things that were contributing to maternal mortality and infant mortality. It was a lot of trauma that they were experiencing in the medical community, in the medical room. Um, it was a lot of um, community violence. There was system violence, like just accessing services, the way people talk to you, the way that they, um, the way that they receive you, the things that they expect of you. I remember, I cannot tell you how many times I've had nurses and doctors ask me if, um, if the, the woman or the father that I was supporting, if they knew who the father of their, of their children were. Like these are not things that, questions that will be posed to a white woman. And even, even myself, when, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I started college as a pre-med student and I had every intention on becoming either an OB or a neonatologist. So I'm very, and I worked in the healthcare field. So I'm very familiar with medical terminology and things like that and know what questions to ask. Very self-aware of my body. I've always been. So even in during my pregnancy, having all of these things working for myself I was still treated as though I did not know any of those things. And I was not expected to know any of those things. Um, I remember being put into a group, a mom group of, um, of women that didn't have, I had nothing in common with. And, you know, we're going over very basic things, things that I already knew. And I'm like, well, why would I, you place me in this group? I think I should be over here in this group. And they're like, oh, well, we just assumed, no, you didn't ask me. So speaking, so giving that as, as the, the foreground, I guess, how or, or what kind of um, injustices have you encountered in working with the medical community, just whether it's advocating at doctor's appointments in the birth room or even afterwards? I don't know um, if you all, how long you all are working with your with your moms, but I know I work with mine until baby is roughly seven years old. So I'm attending pediatric appointments um, and things like that and kind of talking to them and helping them to advocate and at letting them know what questions to ask. And if I sense that they are not comfortable with something saying, hey, you know, you can speak up about this or you can ask this question. How do you guys navigate that, especially when you get resistance from the medical personnel in the room? I'll go. So because this is fresh on my mind, I'm still processing it. So that's we'll give that caveat. So I had a birth not too long ago, young mom, and this was this this is during COVID time. So this again, I think the, her treatment would have been the same. So hospital, I had already had an idea of what to expect at this hospital. Immediately when she told, and also this is a family friend. When she told me where she was giving birth, I said, no, I'm going to be your doula. I, however it needed to happen, I was going to make sure that I was there for that birth because I knew going into that place because where you give birth is really makes a difference. Not only your provider, but where you give birth. So we get there and she, you know, was rocking the pregnancy. Labor and delivery was great. Everything was going fairly well until her provider came in. Immediate, her body changed, her energy changed. She, like the, she was progressing through the labor when that woman came in, when her OB provider came in there, it was all the way completely different. So acknowledging that as a doula, I was stuck. Honestly, I was stuck because I didn't want to be combative. I didn't want to get put out of the room. When the provider first came in, the first thing she said, I didn't know that there could be two people in this room because it was me and the father there. So that was, she led with that. So remember, I had been there through the labor I was the one supporting her and immediately she's combative about there being two people in the room. I didn't know that the policies changed. So we're, this is what we're, we're going through. What, what really was 
really like nailed the, the head on the coffin for me was during her C-section, which I don't think that was it was necessary, but that's another conversation. While she was still on the operating table, this provider berated me and said to me, how do you become a doula? What type of experience do you need to become a doula? How long have you been doing this? She said, because, well, I told mom that we were going to do this. I told her that we were going to induce her. She had a conversation with you and she came back and said that she didn't want to do that anymore. So I didn't know that doulas can give medical advice. I didn't know that that was something that was within their scope. Because I was on the other side of the sheet where with a mom who was like coming to with her anesthesia, you're on the other side of this talking to me in this operator room while the baby is on the table. He also needed to be resuscitated. There's a, that's another thing. So all of these things going around, you're asking me about my experience as a doula, how many years it took, while this mom it can hear you. So being you know, part of something like that, in that moment, I tried to ignore her. She kept going. She kept going with the, why did you do this? Why did you do that? But she was so upset that that mom went against her initial advice. Because I, I gave her information. I said, okay, is this induction medically necessary? That's all I asked her. Because it wasn't, I said, well, this is, these are, these are your options, remember? But there wasn't an option in that hospital. It was what the provider said. But because I presented her with an option, which is well within her right, provider was combative from the very beginning. When she, another part of when she first came in was, why are we doing this? Why are we still here? Why haven't you gotten the Pitocin yet? Didn't I tell you that this is what we were going to do? So I had to back up. I couldn't, it was one of those moments where you, what is it, fight, flight, or freeze, where I just froze. So when I left there, I was in tears because I was so angry. How could this OB provider, who is also a black woman, this mom is a black, the black woman, black baby, you decide to grade me about my experience as a birth worker. As opposed to trying to support her through that, trying to understand why she made that, what her fears were, because she was afraid. So mm-hmm. instead of addressing that, you talk, you put it all of it on me and blaming me for coming here to the C-section. So that is what we have to experience. That is what I have to process so that when my doulas go out to Milwaukee, I have to let them know that these are some of the things that you may have to experience and how you navigate that, how you you are just a fly on the wall. You give this person enough information. Then when the provider comes in, how to basically just be present in a way that's still empowering. That comes with time. That comes with experience because you really have to figure out how to navigate that. That OB provider never looks me in my face. She never addressed me just as, as any didn't ask for my name. So like going through that and processing that, it's I'm glad that I was there for her. I was upset that that hospital had to prove me right. I had to be here to prevent who knows what. I prevented, I mitigated this little bit of risk. Then it's still that savior complex comes in where it's like, well, why does she have to get a C-section? I wish she didn't have to get a C-section. So all of that is coming on me. And that's what therapy is for. So I've been, I've been doing a job with not holding that part of it. I'm so angry. that I couldn't really, t- really you know, tell this provider off because she was um sewing this woman up after they had um put her uterus up. I didn't want to. I don't want to say anything too crazy to her at that time. It wasn't the time and the place for that. And that that was just very insensitive on behalf of the of the yes. physician at yes. that point because um, I had a C section myself and I was very much coherent during the entire procedure. And I've attended um, C sections with some of my clients, and they too were awake and coherent during their procedure. So to have your place when the, when the delivering mom requested that you be there, to have your place where um, your validity being there questioned is that that's just unacceptable. But these are things that, you know, none of us, I don't think are familiar, unfamiliar with um, in, in birth work. Um, I, I've had to um, 
I've had to gather <laughs> a physician or three in in my time supporting moms just because um, medical personnel, they have a way of speaking to you in a way that is so like they have, a, I don't know if it's a course that they take in medical school or in nursing school where they just know how to talk to you in the most condescending way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they speak to you as though these things are absolutes and they present things to you that, and they present it in a way that implies you don't have any other choice. Mm -hmm. You don't have any other options. You have to do this. that part right there. I mm -hmm. see them Correct. Do it with, um, I see them do it with the simplest of things, flu shots. We're going to get your flu shot now. No, there's no informed consent in that conversation. <laughs> there's no, there's, you didn't ask me what I thought, how I was feeling, if this was something that I wanted to do, if I thought about it, nothing. You didn't ask me anything. You told me what you were going to do. And, you know, when it comes down to healthcare in general, in um, communities of color, black communities, indigenous communities, um, trans communities, we've been harmed so much. You know, it's been, it's been taught to us by our grandparents and great grandparents, you know, not to trust these doctors and to try to do the things that we need to do at home so that we can even avoid going to the doctor. And then when we get there, you know, we're not really trusting of the doctor, but at the same time, we're not willing to question anything that the doctor says because they are in fact the doctor. And, and they are white like supremacy. Yeah. Isn't that it? Like that is white supremacy. When you said it was a black woman, I who I felt it in my gut because that is that is what it is. We think we're safe going to black providers. We think we're safe having a black nurse. We think we're safe with having our children with black doctors. That is not the case because they are steeped. They are traumatized by the same system that hurts us. And every doctor, regardless of race, is steeped in that in that indoctrination of white supremacy that lives in the bedrock of the modern medical system. Um, and it's purposeful. And so like even just right now with all the uprisings happening, you see what's happening in medical schools. Black medical students are hot, okay? They are calling it out. They're calling out the racism. They're calling out the hierarchical practices that cause trauma, that have them question themselves and need to assert the superiority complex so that they can just play ball with the rest of the doctors. And then they bring that to us when that was never their intention. They probably got into this for really wholesome, wonderful um, and community led uh, values. And that changes really quickly because the nature of the environment they are in is so toxic. And so, yeah, that's white supremacy for you is that you can, you're not even safe with a black doctor. And it's really about reproductive sovereignty, about knowing that within yourself, you have you have the right to be treated with dignity. You have the right to have access to what you need, to have your concerns heard, to be a collaborator in your health. And that is, I think, one of the most beautiful things that Do The Work does is that we are starting to change cultures and in medical institutions, not necessarily by talking to the medical providers, not necessarily by addressing the medical systems, but by talking to their consumers, the clients, the patients. We are talking to you and letting you know, you have options here. You can advocate for this. You can ask them about that. Um, you can switch your provider whenever you need to. And that is causing people to, or medical providers and institutions to move a little bit differently. And how amazing is it that one parent that we work with is going to give birth to a child that at that pediatric appointment, they're going to be able to say, no, 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 no. Let's talk about this first. Before we do that procedure, before we go on that medication, what else you got? <laughs> what other alternatives are there? Can I have a second opinion? No. I want a second opinion and be able to advocate for their child as that child grows up seeing what it's like to have advocacy, to have agency, to have sovereignty over their own body. And then they pass it on to their children. So this is really about shifting generational trauma and reclaiming what was taken from us when uh, white men decided to enter galleries and use black bodies as examples for experimentation.
And by doing that, it also it also causes a psychological shift. Mm -hmm. So for the work that that I do, because it is, um, you know, mental health is at the core, maternal mental health and infant mental health. So when you have a mom um, or a, a pregnant person that is that feels empowered, that feels seen, that feels listened to, that um, that stabilizes their their hormones and their psychology, which in turn affects their physiology, which has an impact on their developing baby. When if mom is agitated and stressed out and worried and fearful throughout her pregnancy, those things. Um, those things affect baby and baby, when baby is born, baby has, you know, baby experience, experiences anxiety, baby has trust issues. So, you know, baby may be fussier than normal. Baby may be, um, you know, clingy and, and things like that. So all of these things are interconnected, which is why the work that that we all do is so, so incredibly important and so incredibly necessary. And I really hope that those that that are listening that are a part of the medical community, that they are really listening and, and doing um, some some self work and seeing how they show up um, in their patients rooms, because if you're not if you're not aware of yourself or how you are um how white supremacy and um patriarchy and homophobia and all of those things are affecting you and how you do your work you are doing more harm and you are causing further problems that not even the ones that you're trying to get rid of um it's 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 very important that people are self aware when they are in these rooms and dealing with these people and um, and for us as birth workers um, and mental health uh, professionals we have to do the same we have to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves because you do get burned out um, especially when it is something that you are genuinely passionate about I think a lot of people get into work. Um, you know, every birth worker isn't a birth worker. Every person that is, you know, a licensed therapist doesn't need to be a licensed therapist just because you have, you've acquired the credentials. Um, just because you're a doctor, you don't necessarily possess the compassion to really see people and um, and to meet them where they are. And it's the same thing with with birth work. You have to be able to hold that space and you have to be able to be present for what is showing up for you, not for what you want to be there. So if we have a moment, there's a comment that I'd like to address um, because I think it's a beautiful opportunity to have a very um, sensitive conversation. Um, we see a comment here um, that does recognize that not all doctors and nurses are biased. And I'd like to unpack that as a group. So like maybe if we could all unmute ourselves so we could have a little bit more lively of a discussion about that one, because um, there's a lot to unpack in that statement. Um, yeah, so if we could engage in that part of the conversation, please. <laughs> well, I, I heard this. And I, I immediately thought about the way that white folks and cops and people who are um, in the same community as those people, um, as cops and as law enforcement are always like, well, not all, not all cops or men who are like, not all men, right? But it's a system. So it is all, yes and, right? So when I heard, when I saw that, I was like, okay, um, we can acknowledge that doctors and nurses probably, their vendetta isn't to just murder all these babies and these, right? Like that's not, that's not their point. And it still happens at right. disproportionate rates. So we can't, that we cannot acknowledge being like, oh yeah, there's great nurses and doctors and there's a deficit happening. People are missing access and in tune dying because of yeah, um, or doctors right are not and be really biased. Yeah, right. It's and it's rooted 
in oppression. Like that, that is that is oppression. It's rooted in capitalism. It's rooted in making a profit, not human. Like it's not the medicalization and colonization and, and the indoctrination of Western medicine into birth worlds was excruciating. Like that, 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 that did a lot of harm <laughs> that people don't know about. That right. wasn't that wasn't a swift happening. That displaced thousands and thousands of servers of community people with the medicalization mm-hmm. of birth, with the indoctrination of Western medicine into spaces that are people, black women, trans people, birthing bodies, right? And if we're gonna also acknowledge good nurses, we're gonna also acknowledge that this is a whole system and nobody can get out of it unless we destroy all of it, right? It all has to go away. Cause the good don't outweigh the bad. It systematically can't. We don't have access to that. And not only that, everything from the very beginning, because even in um, when when you open up your first textbook in nursing school, in um, in a medical school, all of that data is skewed. It is skewed. There is so much information coming out now about even liver tests, things that allow us to be able to get organ transplants are skewed against people of color because of how our bodies work, not because they work um less efficiently, not because they're more prone to disease, but because of the trauma that we've experienced in this country and in other lands, um, our bodies as black and brown people process proteins differently, process stress differently, um, have different reactions to environmental factors. And when they decided to write formulas for medical procedures, for dosages of medicines, it intentionally excluded the data sets that represent the experiences of black and brown bodies. And so even if you have wonderful bedside manner, even if you're incredibly caring and understanding and compassionate of the lived experiences of your clients or patients, you are participating in a system that is inequitable. You are participating in a racist system. You're participating in a system that is based on white supremacy. I'm not saying now like it's your sole responsibility to fix that, but it is our responsibility as people of this society, as people within the medical system, however we identify ourselves, to be able to start dismantling that process. So what do you need to do to go to your superiors, to go to the people that write these textbooks, to get these patents rewritten for medication, for machines, for systems and processes that exclude Black people from being able to receive the care, the compassion, um, and, and the procedures that they need to be well. And so it's a whole system thing, starting from the minute you crack open that book and moving all the way until you cross that stage and you put um, your diploma in your hand. And the other thing um, that I would like to address about that comment is the fact that um, there isn't a such thing as not all nurses or not all doctors, because no matter what your profession is, you, you harbor by it. I don't care if you're black, white, indigenous, we all have biases based on our experiences. We've all been conditioned um, to, our bodies have been conditioned, our minds have been conditioned to respond a certain way. It's no different than, it's just, it's no different than product placement in movies or things like that. You know, if you see a random can of Pepsi or something in a, in a, in a scene, from your favorite movie, chances are you're going to think, oh, something in your brain is going to say, I think I want a Pepsi because that image has been given. And when we look at the images that we constantly consume on a daily basis, especially when um, our real life interactions do not mimic that or um, do not include people representative of the images that we're seeing, only thing we have to go off of is those images. So you cannot tell me that you do not bring those things into your patient's room because you do. Um, I know that you all take a um, an oath not to do any harm, but the fact of the matter is, is that you all do harm. <laughs> and it might be un- as unintentional as it may be, it's harm nonetheless. So in order to do this work and to 
you know, and when we're talking about the system and being a part of the system, um, if you want to undo the system, you have to start with, with self. And that means sitting with the uncomfortable fact that you may have some biases that you're bringing into the room that you're not aware of. And you can be biased towards someone that is the same color as you. You can be black and be biased against black people. You can be indigenous and biased against indigenous people. It doesn't always have to work in opposite. Sometimes, you know, we're dealing with with internalized racism from people that look just like us. Um, so it's important to to you know really sit with that and do that work. And I know having these conversations are are very difficult because nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to admit that they are racist or that they have, you know, racist tendencies or things like that. That's not, that doesn't make anyone feel good, I would imagine. Um, but in order for you to heal and move past it and make a change, you've got to sit with it and you've got to unpack it and you've got to be able to recognize it when it shows up. And you need to be able to reel it in quick or you need to have people around you that reel it in quick. It's no different than, you know, going to your analogy with cops, Yante. If you have cops that you know are doing harm to people, you know that they are doing things that are against the law or being reactionary in situations where they don't need where a reaction isn't even warranted. And you see this happening and you stand there, and you say nothing. You're just as bad. Complicitness does not absolve you of any guilt at all. And when we're talking about these things, especially as it relates to systemic racism, whether it's in the medical field, because, you know, we're talking about birth and black babies and brown babies. And we're talking about brown mothers and black mothers. This doesn't just happen in the birthing room. This doesn't just happen you know, at prenatal appointments. This happens, you know, when they are children. This happens in in their homes. You know, Linda, you spoke about just being intentional about doing things differently with with your children, which I'm I know that all of us are doing the same things with ours. You know, not spanking because spanking that is something that is rooted in our oppression. And not only that, it is harmful mentally and emotionally and physically to our children. It scars you for life. I still remember beatings I got when I was a kid. So, <laughs> and I remember them like they were yesterday. And I may even still have a, a scar or two. But, you know, we, we reminisce on those things and we do it in a way where it's fond memories. But what it is, is we are normalizing trauma. So, we have to get away from that. If we are to shift the way that birth work is done, if we are to shift the way that systems operate, we have to get away from just about everything that we've been taught to be normal and to be right. That's just my two cents. <laughs> yeah, I want to, um, there was something that you said, Yante, about um, the the beginnings of birth being medicalized. And <clears throat> that right there is, is a violent history and it never stopped being violent, right? So even, even if you are a, a doctor, a nurse who treats your patients with dignity, with respect in your interactions, the protocols, the procedures, right? You don't you don't have any any say in that, right? You you just do it because that's that's how the medical field works. And that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about like individual nurses and individual doctors. We're talking about how violent the medical um the, the health field is. Um, and, and so there's that. And then also um, going back to um, white supremacy, right? How, how we, how we don't just experience racism and, and oppression from 
white people, right? We experience oppression from people that look like us too. I know um, like in, in, in the Latino community, um, this happens a lot, um, classism, right? So um, a, lot of, a lot of times doctors um, that work in, in clinics, or nurses, more doctors, um, they come from other countries. They're not like, you know, Milwaukee bred and, you know, they go on to work in a clinic here in their community. Um, and so these doctors that come from other Latin American countries, they have these prejudices against um, the undocumented immigrant community, right? As inferior and and you get treated as such, you know. Um, you get treated as, as um, not just like you don't know anything, but you don't know better. And um, and I know of people who um, have been scolded from their doctor for getting pregnant again, right? Like, what you're having another baby? What, like, you know, like, and it's really common. It's really common. Um, and so I think what we're all just trying to say here is um, like be self-aware, um, also be aware of the, the system that you work in and, and, and how harmful it is just like um, at its like foundation, you know, um, and that, and we invite you to question that, to question it and um and also to reflect on um all right like i know this um what can i do like on a daily basis in my work you know so that i'm not harming the people that i work with um that's you know that's i think that's what we're all trying to say yeah and it's, it's not just um, in your work, but it starts with your personal life. Um, it's very, it's very um, intentional and very personal work that that we have to do in order to maintain or even establish a level of mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is is really just about being aware of yourself and being aware of your body and the things that you know how you feel and the emotions that come up and um, you know, I know sometimes, for example, I tense up when certain people are around or if I'm in certain situations, being mindful of that and being curious about it, not necessarily being so quick to assign a label to it and saying, oh, you're doing this and wanting so quickly to change the behavior or the feeling, but to really just try to understand it. I implore everyone listening to um, this broadcast myself included, um, to really go about the world with a sense of wonder, a sense of childlike wonder. You know, kids, they really, they don't, they don't come with all of our stuff. They're not, those things are not downloaded to them right away. They receive that information over time. They see, you know, the conversations that are had in their home amongst their parents. Um, they, they see how their parents interact with people and those things then become their core values. Be curious about yourself and your core values and the things that you were taught and be curious about how those things impact other people. You may have been taught this thing, but what impact is that having on someone else? How are you? Be curious about the way that you are projecting you know, when you're supporting, when, whether you are a medical professional, birth worker, therapist, whatever, when people are coming to you in their rawness, because that's what, you know, the, the people that we serve, they are coming to us in their rawness and in their wholeness. We have to be able to be present for that, which is showing up for us, not what we want them to be or what we think they should have done or how they should be. Um, it requires, a, and it's a very intentional thing. You have to be very, very intentional. I don't expect for people to just, you know, get it right away and, and do a complete 180 tomorrow. 
it's a process. Um, I've been practicing mindfulness and, and, and growing in my work. You know, I've been doing this for, for almost 11 years and there is still so much for me to learn. I'm still confronted with my own biases in, in my work. And I have to take a moment and drop in and say, I got to reel it in and, and be present for what is needed, not what I want to be there. And it's a hard thing to do sometimes. And sometimes I'm not always good at reeling myself in. I just had a mama tell me the other day that I said something to them that, you know, that hurt their feelings. And I felt horrible about it because that was not my intention. But I thank them for being honest with me and telling me, you know, how they felt in that moment, because that allowed me to do some more self-assessment so that I can show up and be the best infant mental health consultant that I can be, because ultimately we are there. We want to eradicate systems and we are here to improve birth outcomes. And we cannot do that without improving systems. And we cannot improve systems without improving ourselves because we're all a part of it. Whether we want to be or not, we are all a part of it in some way. Systems don't exist without people. That's just, it's not this fairy thing that's way over here that, you know, doesn't have anything to do with us. We are a part of the system. We are the system. So if the system is to change, we've got to change. And we've got to be intentional about the work that is going to require to do it. So, so we We've been on here hee hawing for <laughs> about almost what an hour and fifteen minutes. I don't know. Does um, anyone have anything else that they want to share, or for any questions, or if there's any questions, does anyone have questions about any of the films? Or well, I guess I can't really answer questions about the films other than my opinion on it. But <laughs> um, you know, anything. Um, someone had a question about resources that they could check out. Where? How far back was that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it. I don't know. I think there might be a delay on our end. Oh, I see it. Skylar asked, what are some resources that you would suggest that are real and create a real conversation around mistreatment in the medical system? Um, there's a wonderful books. Um, Medical apartheid is one of them. Killing black body is another one. Um, they kind of like talk about like the the beginnings of how the modern medical system has been structured, and um, I think that's a wonderful place to start for anybody, whether you're a medical student, whether you're been practicing in in medical uh, field or working in the public health field, um, or you're a birthing person, to be able to kind of understand how. <laughs> modern contraception was created or um, what what went into the bedrock of creating our, our current systems. And then uh, there's awesome groups online um, and, and folks that are talking about the things that are happening around their um, medical institutions or their, their ed, um, academic institutions around creating better dialogue, especially because when you are a student, there is so much hierarchy. Um, and when you get into the field, uh, there is so much hierarchy there. And so being able to create better pathways of interrogating and having conversations with superiors is really integral to being able to investigate uh, or interrogate these, uh, these traumas as they arise, not just um, like in a classroom setting, but when things come up, being able to say, okay, this is a transparent moment for a conversation. Yeah, so I just wanted to show you guys, those that may be questioning, this is the, the book Medical Apartheid, and it's by Harriet Washington. Um, this one is by Dorothy Roberts. This is Killing the Black Body. Um, this is another one. And this one is also by Dorothy Roberts, or I'm sorry, Harriet Washington, A Terrible Thing to Waste. So this book talks a lot about environmental racism and its assault um, on the American mind. And that one is a really good read. And another one that I would recommend is The Deepest Well by Dr. Nadine Burks. I don't know if you guys can see it, I hold it up. Um, but it talks about um, healing the long-term effects of um, childhood 
adversity because those things, you know, when you talk about systems and, and racism, is is not something that's limited to the medical community. The medical community is is a part of a much larger workings. And um, when we experience these traumas early on in life, um, they have long term effects. So um, those are some other resources for you as well. Um, I second those books. I also have those books. And then another one that's specific to breastfeeding, because I always got to put breastfeeding out there and lactation is The Big Letdown by Kimberly Seals Allers. And so the title of it is The Big Letdown How Medicine, Big Business, and Feminism Undermines um, Breastfeeding. So it's about how culture basically sets it up, has set it up that people don't breastfeed and the, the how and the why and how it happens. So. This is a good one about the systemic things, and it has a lot. She has a lot of good references too, because I'm a big reference person too. I think the also a really great resource is people have value people when they say that something is happening and it's not right. Um, if you're not a book person, trans body that have experienced these things, people are not lying. People are not trying to misinform. Do we lose Yante? Yeah, I think so. I think it's. Oh, I thought it was just me. Yeah, I think his screen froze. Um, yeah, honor people's experiences. Um, I think that was essentially the point that he was making. When people tell you that this is how they're feeling or they don't like something, believe them and um, go from there. Um, another question um, that Akila asked is, how do you help women navigate home births? Is this a way around some of the rights infringements that have been spoken about or do they still bubble up if a mother decides to deliver at home? That is so political. People still experience trauma and home birth situations because uh, biases follow everyone, right? We all carry biases wherever we go and that can still uh, show up in home birth spaces. And so um, <laughs> one of the things if people are considering home births um, that I always recommend is choose your midwife wisely um, and, and interview, interview thoroughly, ask them questions, ask them about your religious practices, ask them about your cultural practices, listen to how they respond to those things. That'll give you an inkling. You will have a gut feeling. You will have, um, a certain knowing within your spirit of whether or not that person can hold you or not. It's not whether or not they can just deliver your baby in a safe manner. Can they hold you in your totality and your wholeness, um, and how you show up in this world and, and um, if the answer is no, then you, you find another provider if you are able to. Um, and if you can't, then having a doula is wonderful, but um, is also necessary in those spaces uh, to be able to support the desires and wishes and your dignity in that, in that position. But just because people choose home births or out of hospital births does not exempt them from those situations. True. <laughs> It really does not <laughs> exempt them from those situations. Um, and again, we see the same thing, well-meaning providers unaware that they are perpetuating systems of oppression, um, say some disrespectful and um, hurtful things to people or do disrespectful and hurtful things. And so um, it's just, a, it's about being as informed as possible about knowing your rights. Um, and, and that's one way that doulas can definitely help is helping you investigate what is available to you in your neighborhood. Um, and in Wisconsin, we're fortunate that midwifery is legal. One, let's talk about that. <laughs> um, but also that we have options. We have wonderful home birth midwives like uh, prison birth midwifery, Sasha Barif, who is um, our state's first Afro-Latina midwife. Um, and and um, 
doing amazing work to be able to provide access to black and brown communities um, around home birth. But yes, it, it's the same, it's the same. Yes, because we have to remember that whether we use, I, I tell my clients this all the time, like when, they, when I'm explaining what a doula is, we used to live in groups and villages of people so that there was an older woman who would come, she would catch her baby, the, the community would take care of you, right? Then when somebody told us that that was no longer safe, we moved to hospitals. Now you made this grand midwives, you made this traditional form of healing, something that was unsafe, that was not savage, but a way like that was for the lower class. But you reclaimed that. White women did that. They reclaimed midwifery. When black women taught them everything they know. If you read Killing the Black Body, black <laughs> women who were who came from the continent taught us how to birth, how to catch babies, how like in the postpartum period, what herbs to use. If somebody cut their knee, these were the healers. So this is something that has been appropriated and colonized in such a way. And now it's this, this kitschy thing and you see all of these things on, you know, all these home births on Instagram. Whereas we've been so traumatized that we forgot. It's still within you. You just have to remember it. And so what Leanne's point said, like if somebody, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. My mom says, if you don't get the warm fuzzies, there's a black provider, a black indigenous person of color, or it's a white provider. If you don't get that something in the shana not, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Really trust that, but just lean into that knowing whether you are in a hospital or birth center or at home, just know that these systems have been configured in such a way over time to be what it is. And if you if you understand his history, try not to like put it on you, but take that as some information so that you can make an informed decision. That's the biggest thing that we as birth workers teach our clients is to make an informed decision. But if you don't have an option, you don't have choice. If you don't know that there's this uh, this thing over here, there's no choice. This is the only thing that you have accessible to you. But just be we just like to remind people that you have an option in everything that you do and all of the decisions that you make within your birth and beyond. Yes, and, and I would like to second that. And, you know, that applies to not just your birth experience, but even your parenting experience. I know there are a lot of families that are working with prenatal care coordination agencies and child care coordination agencies. And um, a lot of some of those agencies provide offer doula services. Some of them don't. But ultimately, it is your choice. You, they work for you. And I'm saying this as a PNCC provider, they work for you. So you have every right to ask them questions in how they can support you beyond the birth of your child, not just during your pregnancy, but beyond that, because technically they are supposed to be with you for a length of time. And in what capacity are they do are they willing to support you? Because that's that's another thing. Um, there are a number of resources available to expecting women birthing people, um, new parents, mothers and fathers. Do your research, ask the questions, and make your expectations known. And if they are not willing to do that, you have every right to leave and go to somebody else. And providers also reserve that right to say, hey, I cannot support you in this way. I cannot hold this space for you. So here, let me recommend you to someone else or I suggest you find someone else. I think that is the part that we really need to normalize in addition to just self-advocacy, but normalize practitioners um, and other serving, you know, doulas, PNCC workers, therapists, what have you, normalize telling people that you do not have the bandwidth or the capacity to meet their needs and being okay with saying so. And also having some other resources that may be able to assist them in the way in which they need, because you don't have to take everybody on as a client just because they are coming to you for service. So does, um, before I wrap up, does anyone have anything else that they would like to add? 
I have to plug Maroon Calabash. So if you're looking for ways to support <laughs> black and brown birth workers, supporting black and brown people in the community of Milwaukee, um, whether it's accessing midwifery care, um, our partner, Prison Birth Midwifery, again, Sasha Barif, a certified um, uh, home birth midwife, uh, is providing equal access care um, to folks in the pandemic. In the beginning of the pandemic, folks weren't able to really go, go to see their doctors. So she was providing prenatal care or postpartum care until you could get to see your provider. Um, so you can know that your baby is okay, that your body is healing, that um, you're not testing positive for something that could be a complication for your pregnancy. Um, but even outside of that, creating access for people who wanna birth however they want to birth um, and, um, uh, of course, doula services, being able to communicate with um, trained professionals who are there to be in your corner, who are not judgmental about your decisions, um, and who only investment is that you um, are moving through this journey in wellness and with information and with care and support. And so if you're interested in supporting that work, um, you can go to at Maroon Calabash on Instagram or on Facebook um, or MaroonCalabash.com. And there's ways and links and um, information everywhere about our initiative, where our money goes. 100% um, of it goes to be able to create access for birthing people in Milwaukee without passing the cost on. We talk about this and it's, it's beautiful to be able to have conversations about access, but really when it comes down to it, we're really talking about financial, um, uh, justice. We're talking about economic justice because without these pathways to access, without funds like ours, a lot of people are going to go without the services that they need, without the advocacy and support that they need. Um, and so funds like this make it possible that nobody gets turned away, that we serve families until completion. We're not saying, okay, here's three postpartum visits and we're done. Have a, <laughs> have a happy you know, uh, rest of your postpartum period with your baby. We are giving you exactly what you need. If that means we come to your house six hours for 14 weeks, <laughs> we will make it possible because that's what you need and that's what community is. And when we talk about decolonizing, we talk about reclaiming, that is the what that looks like. Um, and it's time to normalize that that kind of care, that deep kind of care. Um, as we wait for our community to reassemble itself, um, we can provide that in spaces like this. So if you'd like to donate, please head over there. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess since we're <laughs> doing shameless plugs, I should tell people um, my organization, The Mindful Mama, um, I am a prenatal care coordination, child care coordination agency um, with a focus on maternal and infant mental health. So. Um, while I do a lot of the same work that doulas do in terms of supporting throughout the birth process, um, a lot of the, the bulk of my work comes with the parenting postpartum. So um, I have licensed therapists that are on board with me as well as um, certified and trained doulas um, that are able to provide that space. But more importantly, working to just kind of decolonize parenting and how that has done and the impacts, the adverse impacts that it has had on our children's development, um, helping you understand from a parenting perspective and from a mental health perspective, how your engagement, how your relationship with your children affects how they develop cognitively and emotionally and understanding what that looks like, understanding how your children communicate and what they're actually saying to you, even though they don't have the vocabulary to express that. Um, helping you understand why you too need rest and you need to hold space for yourself so that you can show up for your children and create space for them. So um, I can be found at the mindful mama verse um, dot com information on the website, Facebook and Instagram. So and see my shirt, the hashtag I save babies. Um, I do accept donations as well. So um, use that the at sign at I save babies for Cash App and for Venmo. So, does anyone have anything else they want to add? Okay, wonderful. 
Well, um, we are going to wrap things up and, and go ahead and get out of here. Um, I just want to take a moment to um, thank everybody for participating. This has been such a wonderful discussion and I was really happy to be here and I really enjoyed talking to you all. I hope that we continue this after um, this conversation tonight. Um, and I also want to mention the upcoming conversation with Jenny Joseph, who is the CEO founder of Common Sense Childbirth Incorporated in Florida. And um, if you watch the film American Dream, she was in that film and she has over 25 years experience of midwifery. Um, and she owns she actually owns the first black woman owned nationally accredited midwifery school in the United States. So that conversation is going to air actually this Wednesday, September 16th at 5.30 p.m. So make sure you come back to the Milwaukee Film page at that time to hear that conversation with her. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you all for your questions. I hope that we've provided some insight into birth work um, and birthing while Black, Indigenous, Latina, trans, and all of that, um, feel free to contact us individually or um, if you have any other questions. And until next time. Oh, wait, I forgot to shout out myself. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> doulas at milwaukee.gov, that is my email if you want to more information about the bomb doula program we're rolling out this fall fingers crossed i don't have a date if anybody knows anything about programming i don't have a date yet but bomb doulas at milwaukee.gov thank you all linda yante you have anything you want to add before? I'm just thankful to have been in space with y'all. It's been a long time since I've been with people, and it's still good. The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff.